Welcome to the second ever United State of Women Summit. What does the United State of Women look like? It looks like women and girls all across this country feeling safe in their homes. Every single person in this room has a voice and deserves to be heard. Women know how to speak truth, and that's what women are doing right now. The truth has now set us free. Mark these words, it ends with us. That we are not just our gender on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we are not just our race on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. We are all of who we are every single day in every single way. White people need to dare imagine the realities inhabited by people of color. Not only because this is the moral thing to do, but because we are, all of us, affected by racism. That we have everything inside of us we need to be successful, and you don't need other people's permission to be great. Go out there and change the world. And you own that power, and don't let anybody suggest to you you're the only one. Yes. Brand up your love life with the Anything else you're on? A man of your dreams is just a click away. No, I don't. I'm fine. Thank you. Yep. We are four smart, successful women. I don't need a man. What is the point? Who still has any interest? Ladies, I am not going to let us become those people who stop living before they stop living. I would like to introduce you to Christian Grey. This is for mature audiences. Certainly sounds like us. Oh, wow. Slim? My, oh, my. What's it been, 40 years? That's impossible. That would mean I was only six. <laughs> this is going to be a game changer. Ooh, you need some help? <laughs> I don't think you have that on quite right. Can you get me some scissors? I can't feel my feet. Do you even remember your last date? We're talking Nixon era. <laughs> hey! Shh. Pretty sure he knows you're in here. I don't care what society says about women our age. You are better at this than you think you are. The choice should be ours. Shut up and kiss me. Ow! Do we want another bottle? Yeah. Yeah. Free is the story of a 12 year old girl named Lucky who moves with her father from the big city to the frontier. Smell that country air. Smells like manure. Lucky, he's a total fish out of water. You only have one chance to make a proper first impression. <sighs> Some first impression I'm gonna make. I look like a marshmallow with feet. She's new to school, she's just new to everything. She's finding herself and she comes along Prue and Abigail. Hi. I like your hair ribbon. Well, I like your horses. They're beautiful. We are the pals. It's awesome. Pals forever. Woohoo! They all bring different contributions to the friendship. Prue is definitely kind of like the brains of the group, but they always work well together. Abigail is super silly. <gasps> um, she's really funny. She's really adorable. And she has a really big heart. I don't know how much of a competition it's going to be because we're all gonna do equally well and then braid each other's hair and cut it Welcome to the second ever United State of Women Summit. What does the United State of Women look like? It looks like women and girls all across this country feeling safe in their homes. Every single person in this room has a voice and deserves to be heard. Women know how to speak truth, and that's what women are doing right now. The truth has now set us free. Mark these words, it ends with us. Right. That 
we are not just our gender on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we are not just our race on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. We are all of who we are every single day in every single way. White people need to dare imagine the realities inhabited by people of color. Not only because this is the moral thing to do, but because we are, all of us, affected by racism. That we have everything inside of us we need to be successful. And you don't need other people's permission to be great. Go out there and change the world. And you own that power. And don't let anybody suggest to you you're the only one. Please welcome to the stage Tina Chen, Taylor Barnes, and Jordan Brooks. Good afternoon, United States of Women! First of all, I want to thank DJ Young One for that incredible set. No better person to play us on, thank you. And I also want to thank our incredible live stream team, Women Rising, for making this summit accessible to people all across the country through our live stream. Thank you. <laughs> what we saw in that video is just a fraction of the energy I know we are all feeling today. I hope everyone is coming out of their breakouts thinking about what action steps they're going to take, who they're going to connect with, and how we can move this forward. And before I let you guys all off the hook, I want to make sure you're connected with the United States of Women. So everyone pull out their phones. I want to make sure you like us on Facebook, you follow us on Twitter, and you follow us on Instagram because we want to continue to do this with you. And I also want you to tag five of your friends who aren't in the room today who you want to join this movement. Well, and we at the United States of Women have been thinking about really taking action. And so, you know, we at the United States of Connect, we convene and we amplify. That's what we're all about. And we, as we're starting, you know, thinking about this year and thinking about 2020, I'm excited to announce that we at the United States of Women, with all of you, between now and the end of this year, will work to spur one million actions for gender equity. Woo! Woo! To do so, today we relaunched and revamped USOW Action Center so you can find organizations and opportunities in your community where you can take action right away when you walk out of this door. We also would love your help to map the women's movement. We're trying to figure out where all those incredible organizations are around the country that are doing this great work, and we need your help. So come to our Action Center and do that. We're launching our first ever United States of Women Ambassador Program, which you can apply for online to be the ambassador to the United States of Women in your community, bringing organizations and individuals together to make change. And finally, we're announcing a USOW Digital Force Fellows Program, which will recruit emerging content creators, many of you in the room, I am sure, and pair them with media platforms, the end goal being to own the internet with our force for gender equity. And finally, we're excited to announce a new content partnership with Awesomeness TV and Clover Letter to reach Gen Z women across the country. So we are connecting, we are convening, we are amplifying. And now, now we are gonna take action. So consider this your official call to action. From now and when you leave here, we are doing it across the eight pillars of United States of Women because what we are learning here together is we are stronger together, we are acting together, we are gonna support each other, whether we are working on immigration or employment or education or health or combating violence against women. Because we are gonna do a million, how many? One million actions by the end of 2018. Because I will tell you, United States of Women is not just a day and an event. United States of Women is not just a state of mind. United States of Women is not just a collection of folks coming together. United States of Women is about taking action and making change. Are you with us? All right, let's go.
Please welcome Vice President of the Minneapolis City Council, Andrea Jenkins, and Representative Ilhan Omar. Good afternoon. This is my first time at the United States of Women's Summit. And let me tell you, standing on this stage and looking out at all of you is very powerful experience. And to be coming together, not only in resisting, but in reshaping and restoring our nation's founding promise. Representative Omar and I share something in common. Besides being from the great state of Minnesota, we're both first. I am the first openly transgender black woman ever elected to public office in America. And I am the first Somali-American legislator elected in the United States of America. And while celebrating firsts is important, we also have to think about what it means that firsts exist. The very act of breaking a barrier means that there is a barrier to be broken. Right now, women make up less than 20% of our federal legislators and about 25% of our state legislators. Last time I checked, women make up over 50% of America. That's why, that's why our work must be about more than just breaking barriers we must focus on dismantling them once and for all. That's why I'm thrilled to see this wave of women stepping up and stepping into political leadership, especially at the state and local level. That's where huge important decisions get made that impact how we as women live our lives. Right here in LA, we have so many examples of powerful women taking charge in elected office. For example, four of five county supervisors are women. We celebrate supervisors Han, Solis, Quell, and Berger. In fact, we'd like to recognize all of the incredible elected officials here today. So, if you are an elected official, please stand up and remain standing. We would like to recognize those of you who have heard the call and are currently running for office. If that's you, please stand up and remain standing. Okay. Okay, is anybody out there thinking about running for office? If you're thinking about running for office, please stand up and remain standing.
And as you probably know, Andrea and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't a village. So if you are here doing the important work of supporting someone running for office, please stand up and stand and remain standing. So literally, everybody in the room should be standing right about now. But if you are excited to head to the voting booth this year and vote for the incredible women on the ballot who are dismantling patriarchy, sexism, and racism, Please stand up and remain standing. Wow. As I said a moment ago, that standing here looking out at you was a powerful experience. But that just blew me away. Thank you for being here today. With that energy, we are confident those barriers do not stand a chance. Thank you for signing up to fight for our collective liberation. And here is to a big win in 2018. Thank you. Thank you. Please give a warm welcome to Alicia Garza. Black people are a powerful portal to a future where all of us belong. Black people have shown this country time and time again that another we is possible a we that is grounded in respect and care and dignity and safety and well-being. The country right now is at a crossroads. We face hard choices as a nation on which way to go. Will we go backwards into more fear, more isolation, more division? Or will we move forward towards a caring economy, a robust democracy, where we all get what we need to live powerfully and live well? Will we move towards a society where all lives actually do matter? Not just as rhetoric or ways to avoid the reality of white supremacy and racism, but as the way that we live and work and play. Which way will we go? Now, my passion is making black communities powerful. And I dream of a future where black people have what all people deserve. It's time to bring the power of protest into politics. That's why I started the Black Futures Lab because we work to make sure that all black people have a strong voice in the decisions that are made about us. Now look, we all know elections matter, but a robust democracy matters too. And for me, when I think about democracy, I think about power. And when I think about power, power for me means getting to make decisions over your own life. Power means control over the story of who we are and who we can be, and where money does and doesn't go. It means getting to decide what is right and what is wrong, and it means that there are consequences when the people who we elect to serve our interests don't do what they're supposed to do. Black people deserve to be powerful, in the last three election cycles, black women voted at higher rates than any other group. 
But black women are still only 6% of US Congress. And that means that white men are making decisions about you and me, and that ain't right. That ain't right. All black communities deserve to be heard which is why we're talking to 200,000 black people across the country, rural and urban, immigrant and citizen, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated about the issues that we care about and listening for the best solutions for the challenges that we face through our black census. You can take it now, go to blackcensus.org. Now look, we're changing the story about what black people care about and who black people are. We are changing stories into policy and we are using policy as a guidepost for candidates who want our votes. We can make black communities powerful. We will know that we are winning when we get to decide what's happening in our communities and when all of our families get to live well. Are you with me? We need you. Together, we can change the balance of power in this country. And we can ensure that black people have the power that we deserve to live well. Will you join me? Will you join me? Now, it is now my pleasure to introduce a lineup of powerful women leaders from right here in Los Angeles and from all over the country making their calls to action that I think we'd all be wise to take heed of. Thank you, let's get it. Four percent. I want you to remember that number because it's the paltry percentage of philanthropic dollars that goes to women and girls in the United States. Four percent. My name is Serena Khan. I'm the CEO of the Women's Foundation of California. I'm a proud Californian by way of Connecticut and Pakistan. I was born to a, in Pakistan to a Muslim family. I'm an immigrant. I'm a lesbian. I'm a woman of color. And I stand alongside each of you in our commitment to justice and freedom. The last year has demonstrated that when we stand together, embracing our differences, we are powerful, powerful in community, powerful in our organizing, powerful in building coalitions, and powerful in building the world we all deserve to live in. From Hollywood to Silicon Valley, from the Capitol to the farms of the Central Valley, from office workers to domestic workers, we are saying enough. We're saying no to sexual assault, no to being paid less for the same work, no to violence at work, no to violence at home, in our streets, and in our schools. We're stepping into our power and unleashing it so that we all flourish. As trans and cisgender women, as girls, as queer women, as Muslims, as undocumented immigrants, low-wage workers, and incarcerated people. The Women's Foundation of California has organized our work around one core belief, which is that people who are closest to the problems in their communities are in the best position to solve those problems. And we're doing just that by organizing, by running for office, and by advocating for policies that advance justice. So I leave you with one call to action. Let's take that paltry 4% and say we deserve more. Partner with your local women's foundations to support the leading organizations advancing gender justice. In California, at the Women's Foundation of California, we're part of a national philanthropic 
collaborative of young women's initiatives that you'll hear about in a moment. We are partnering with women's foundations in New York, in DC, Western Massachusetts, Memphis, Tennessee, Birmingham, Alabama, and Dallas, Texas. The what? Minnesota, the, the other statewide Minnes the other statewide women's foundation, Minnesota. All of us are working together in collaboration. So work with us, partner with us, follow us on social media, work with us and put your money where it matters. Work with us to put millions of dollars in the hands of community leaders and young women and girls of color who are working on pay equity, affordable childcare, workplace protections, ending gender-based violence, ending exclusionary school disciplinary policies, criminal justice reform, expanding reproductive rights and justice, and environmental justice. We are feminists for racial, economic, and gender justice. And justice is our investment plan. Thank you. My name is Kalisha DeSeuss, and I'm the director of the National Philanthropic Collaborative of Young Women's Initiatives. My name is Joanne Smith, and I'm the founder and executive director of Girls for Gender Equity. The Young Women's Initiative centers the voice, the leadership, the advocacy, the power, and the brilliance of young cis and trans women of color and indigenous young women across the United States. YWY is about racial and gender equity, cross-sector partnerships, policy, legislative, and systems change. YWI began in New York City as a partnership with Girls for Gender Equity, the New York Women's Foundation, the New York City Speaker's Office, and hundreds of youth and advocates. Together we designed a process whereby young people direct the ways that we shift policy and funding to transform their lives. Two years ago at the last United States of Women, myself and eight Women's Foundation CEOs across the country committed to creating the conditions for girls of color and TGNC youth to be centered within the racial and gender justice movement. Our commitments meant that they would not be left behind. This call to action has, had, has made waves across our country. Today, over 150 young women across eight regions are members of Young Women's Advisory Councils. They are driving their communities to both recognize the structural barriers that create obstacles for young women of color and recognize the endless strengths that they bring to the table as advocates, policymakers, community organizers, and change agents. They are driving their communities to understand that everyone benefits when we center and invest in the leadership of young women of color. Here's how they're catalyzing change. Anin and Nishnawe do Nichelle Bibo and Indigena Kanigu, Awasa Seen and Du Dame, Gazaga Squad, Jamaica, Nindunjaba, Bugadawaning Ninda. As the leader of the Young Women's Initiative of Minnesota, I represent 800 young women of color, including Native American women. Too often, we are told to be resilient. My leadership is going to demand that we build resilient systems for girls just like us. Hello, my name is Omrani Gomez-Hernandez. I'm a proud member of the Young Women's Initiative in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> Research shows that young women of color want to attend college. We are already making a difference today and are ready to be the doctors, lawyers, engineers and elected officials of tomorrow. It is important that we are at the planning table to ensure that programs for young, for young women of color succeed. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Sasha Williams, and I'm a proud member of the Young Women's Initiative in the Bay Area. In the Bay Area, young girls of color are sexually harassed, assaulted, and abused in their schools, jobs, and communities. But when talking about sexual harassment, we often leave these young girls of color's experiences and voices out of the conversation, and that needs to stop. Yes. Through the Young Girls and through the Young Women's Initiative, I want to eliminate sexual harassment with my team and create solutions that are informed by these experiences and voices of these young girls, because that's what will make a difference in our communities. Hi, my name is Ramona Williams, and I am part of a task force with the Young Women's Advisory Council. It's a group of young women in Western Massachusetts who are trying to combat the rape culture in our community and potentially the world. Our YWAC is addressing topics such as dress code, sexual assault, assault and most importantly, the heart of what rape culture really means in America today. My name is Magan Jean-Louis, and I am a member of the Young Women's Advisory Council at Girls for Gender Equity in New York City. <laughs> I have been able to guide and influence citywide policy, budgeting, and programming for young cis and trans women of color and gender non-conforming people of color. It's important to center them in these conversations, okay? We need to build a world that is for us and by us, okay? Creating and influencing change at different systemic levels has encouraged me to believe that I am capable of making a difference in this world. And I believe in the work that we are doing together and that we will sustain this movement for the betterment of our society in the future. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jada Powell, and I am a member of the Memphis Young Women's Advocacy Center Council. And I've been a part of Girls, Inc. since I was five years old. Using the core value of Girls Inc., inspiring all girls to be strong, smart, and bold, we focus on making a difference and a change to education, educational injustices within all girls and all communities from all girls of color. From curriculum to testing to athletics, we want to ensure that all girls like us no longer face discrimination and sexual harassment or just regular harassment in schools or in communities. We believe through advocacy and collaboration that we can achieve this we can achieve our vision. And Janelle Monet once said in her album, well, in her song, I'm gonna keep leading like a young Harriet Tubman. So we're all gonna keep leading like young Harriet Tubman. Hey everyone. My name is Romani Wilson and I'm from Washington, DC. I'm a part of the Young Women's Advisory Council of DC where we work to address and eliminate issues that women of color face on a daily basis. My, yeah. <laughs> My leadership will not only demand for our voices to be heard, but for them to be understood and for change to be produced. Too often we are ignored, but this will end with us today because no is not an answer. Thank you. Hi, you guys. My name is Simon, and I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> in my city, girls of color constantly neglect their mental health, whether it be intentional or not. This is due to the lack of mental health education and the stigma surrounding it. Through the Young Women's Initiative, I would like to educate young women, especially those of color, on mental health so they can feel comfortable with seeking help if need be. Thank you. <laughs> to be here, it's so great to be in this place among powerful mujeres. With me here today, a group of immigrant young women doing great work in their community, organizing and volunteering. I'd like
like to introduce to you a fierce young woman. She is an organizer with Next Gen California in the, in the Palmdale area. Uh, please help me uh, welcome her. Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you so much. My name is Marisol Chavez, and like Ruby stated, I am an organizer with NextGen California in Palmdale. And today, um, I'll be sharing a little bit about myself. Um, it's important to know that everyone's story is very important, and my story is not any different from other stories the immigrant youth in the community have been sharing across the nation. So, there are approximately 3.6 undocumented immigrants in the United States that uh, were brought into the United States before their 18th birthday. And I am one of them. I was born in Mexico. I was born in Mexico and I came to the United States when I was four years old. My parents brought me and my sisters here for a better life, better opportunities. I grew up calling this great country my home. I was a senior in high school, looking forward to the next chapter in my life, like every high school senior. And soon I realized I wasn't able to attend the university that I was accepted to because of my status. I did not possess the required documentation to apply for financial aid or apply for a loan. And that was, that was very heartbreaking. I grew up in fear my entire life. Fast forward, it's 2012. The Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals went into effect. <laughs> allowing hundreds of undocumented young immigrants, including myself, to obtain a work permit and be protected from deportation. <laughs> it's funny because I, I, I well, I didn't know where I was born exactly until I was filing my DACA application and only because my parents didn't really tell me that growing up, so because of the fear. I am privileged to attend a great school where I currently attend business administration, I'm studying business administration, and I am going to be an immigration attorney and pay it forward. <laughs> However, not all undocumented immigrants have this opportunity to attend college. Others weren't, as lucky, weren't lucky to be covered under the DACA program. Yes. Many face a harsher reality. It's 2018, and we face a different reality. One where the current administration has ended the DACA program. One where I see my community living in fear. But I will not go back and hide into the shadows Instead, I am channeling all my energy into getting people that are able to vote to take action and vote for, the, for people who will address this issue. I'd like to ask everyone in this room to take their phones out, please. <laughs> and go to nextgen.us slash pledge to vote. So that is nxtgn.us 
slash pledge to vote. Before I go, I'd like to share a quote from Robert F. Kennedy. Our attitude towards immigration reflects our faith in the American ideal. We have always believed it is possible for men and women who start at the bottom to rise as far as talent and energy allow. Neither race nor place of birth shall affect their chances. We all deserve an opportunity. Thank you so much. afternoon and thank you all for being here. I'm Lilibeth Navarro, disability rights advocate. History tells us that it was actually the women who convinced our founding fathers to make the opening statement to the Constitution a more inclusive phrase. We the people, we all know that, right? And we, the we, included women, mothers of patriots who were patriots themselves, who took care of the wounded in battle. The women also knew that all included us, people with disabilities. We have endured for years, and still do, the isolation, the rejection of our families, and society. Our discrimination stories were painful and dramatic. Without the guaranteed protections under the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which unfortunately excluded us. However, however, <laughs> learning from the great Martin Luther King, Jr. <laughs> we gathered our community and led a big group of disabled advocates. We called ourselves the wheelchair warriors. <laughs> to demand a radical change to the physical environment. To travel, to communication, to employment, and housing. Our intrepid women leaders kept the movement alive by getting everyone to send Congress their discrimination diaries as overwhelming evidence of the need for our own civil rights legislation. Finally, the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed into law on July the 26th, 1990. So, for the first time in our lives, people with wheelchairs could go out with friends on a date. They could work, travel. I've just been to DC last week. <laughs> People with visual and sensory disabilities could touch, feel, and see their environment. Those with mental and learning disabilities became part of this human experience of exploring what life is about. We rose from obscurity to visibility. <laughs> and even started an international revolution, transforming other countries and, and inspiring them to create access for all people. This year, the ADA is 28 years old. The bandana in my back says 25, that's an old one. 
<laughs> but the ADA is being weakened by the Office of the State Architect and the State Building Standards Commission. They are fighting local activists who have gained incredible expertise and whose work over the years made California's version of the ADA better than the federal version. Yes, we have a stronger ADA. To make matters worse, this trend has accelerated into a federal effort to weaken the ADA. So, our call to action. Please call Governor Brown and tell him to stop, stop the attack on the ADA. Call your legislators to stop this misguided effort to roll back on our access civil rights. No government should be able to rescind our civil rights. Oh no, over our dead batteries. With the ADA, we are unleashing the unimaginable rewards of our varied contributions to humanity. We are here to demystify the disability experience because really disability and disease are part of human life. So as technology progresses and, tax and tasks get easier, and easier for us, and as we in the disability community grow closer and closer to optimum participation, one day we shall meet at that beautiful, authentic point of human understanding. And with our children, we will build a new world which includes all. And that's us, we the people. Thank you. What's up, United States of Women? I am so honored to be amongst all of you amazing advocates and activists stepping into your power stepping into our power as we work to break down any barriers that would hold us back. I'm Renata Simrel, and I'm president and CEO of the LA84 Foundation, but I'm here as a fearless board member for Greater Los the United Way of Greater Los Angeles. And I'm here representing Elise Buick, the first woman to lead the United Way here in Los Angeles. She's sorry that she couldn't be here today, but she is confident and the power of everyone here today and those watching on across the country on television to ensure that we achieve equality of opportunity for women and girls, particularly our most vulnerable sisters. You know, we have much to be proud of here in Los Angeles. We're the most diverse city in the country. Get, can I get a shout for LA? The most diverse city with boundless opportunities for success the perfect place to pursue your dreams. But unfortunately, not everyone in Los Angeles is able to share in all the opportunities this great city has to offer. And far too many of our fellow Angelinos are homeless and living on the street. Listen to this. Close to 60,000 men, women, family, and children are without a place to call home. 60,000 and nearly 18,000 of our sisters, our daughters, our mothers are sleeping on the street today. And that's a 17% increase in just one year. And as we all know, life on the street is more dangerous for women, children, and our families. But you know what? The United Way of Greater Los Angeles took the lead on the challenge of ending homelessness 10 years ago. And since that time, we've made connections, took action, We've marched, tweeted, made calls, hosted events, lobbied our elected officials, testified, integrated new technology, shared stories, and created a movement with our community partners to pass two ballot initiatives that will provide over $5 billion. Did you hear me? 
five billion dollars to build housing and provide homeless services in LA County over the next 10 years. And now, now we're doubling down. Earlier this year, we lost, launched the Everyone In campaign, and I hope you all saw the big door outside. This is a reinvigorated movement to engage all Angelenos in ending homelessness. And we're asking that everyone, including each and every one of you, to join in to ensure that we will break through stereotypes and activate hearts and minds. That we will change the narrative and engage people in their own communities. And that we will organize and activate vocal supporters, but we will also galvanize the quiet majority in our community of change. And we've already started. This year, we're planning the Home Walk, and the Home Walk is a gathering of more than 10,000 soldiers in an army of change that last year raised funds to permanently house 1,000 of our brothers, sisters, mothers, and daughters. And we will be inviting everyone to join as we mobilize, raise our voices, and walk with passion and purpose to end homelessness. And we're asking that all of you join with us too. So let me end with my call to action. I'm asking if you all are all in. Are you all in? Yeah. Let me hear you say, I'm in. I'm in. Let me hear you say, I'm in, to make sure we're supporting our most vulnerable sisters. Are you in? I'm in. Let me hear you say, I'm in, to welcome new people to the table and invite the whole community to work together. Are you in? I'm in. Let me hear you say, you're in, if you're in, to open your hearts and minds to a future where everyone's contribution is valued and everyone is invited to be part of the solution. Are you in? in. Then if you're all in, join with us, the United Way of Greater Los Angeles, in our fight to end homelessness. so excited to be here. My name is Julie Miller Phipps. I'm the president for Kaiser Permanente in Southern California. Thank you. The, <laughs> thank you. So May, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and I want to talk to you about mental health issues for women. What we can do to create an environment in this country, in California, in Southern California, where mental wellness is really what we talk about. We have conversations that started this morning about stigma and breaking down the stigmas of mental health, and we need to continue those conversations this afternoon. Depression, plus the complications that go along with that, sleep disorders, anxiety, substance abuse, they're affecting 16 million Americans today in this country. It chips away at, the, at our ability to work, to care for our loved ones, our relationships, and our very sense of self-worth. Women expre experience depression and anxiety at twice the rate of men. Twice the rate. And yet many women won't seek help. If we do, we think we're being selfish, or we're going to take time away from our families, or we're being weak. It's not weak. We're often told, tough it out, be resilient. Everyone, anyone ever heard that? Yeah. Those, those well-intentioned words cause us to become a prisoner of fear, of self-judgment, and cause us to keep from reaching out. This is the very definition of stigma, right? It's a negative effect that it can have. And yet there's treatment. There is treatment and there's hope. 80% of people who seek treatment for depression see improvement, 80%. And so how do we bridge the gap? How do we get from here to there? Stigma drives silence, and silence drives stigma. It's only by being vocal, by speaking up, by not being silent, that we can open the doors for others so that they can come into the light and seek help. So I'm asking you today to find your words, find your words, and help others find theirs. How do we do that? Well, I'm going to give you something today that you can start with. If you take out your cell phones and type in findyourwords.org, all lowercase, one word, findyourwords.org. 
It's Kaiser Permanente's interactive portal that works to break the silence around depression and encourages open and honest communication to occur. You'll find lots of information there to help yourself and to help others. Now scroll down where it says share your story. Go ahead and click on the link to download the app from our partners at StoryCorp. And when you get home tonight, take a minute for yourselves. Take a minute for yourselves and record and share your own story about how depression has affected you or affected a loved one. Talk about their struggles. Talk about your experience. Talk about your triumphs. Talk about your hopes. And do this so that all other people who are struggling with similar circumstances can learn and feel inspired by you. Feel inspired by all of you here. With the collective voices in this room, we can create a symphony of voices that uplift and support others who are struggling with, with depression and anxiety. And so let me hear from you. Will you join us and share your story? Say thrive. thrive. Thank you. I'm Vanessa Daniel from Groundswell Fund and Groundswell Action Fund. I'm an American. I'm the daughter of proud immigrants from Sri Lanka and of a white feminist mother with roots in Selma, Alabama. My, my partner is a Jamaican-American woman and our brilliant six-year-old daughter is black and Irish. And as I look out on this crowd of every gender and every hue, I know in my bones that the kind of America that I want to live in is one where all of us are free to be whole in our humanity. Whether we are of color or white, queer or straight, cis, trans or gender queer, undocumented or citizen, free. How many of you all want that kind of America for yourselves and for your children? But well, one of the most important things that we can do to bring it about is to support the leadership of women of color. When we look at the movement for liberation in this country and who is showing up most boldly for freedom in the streets and in the ballot box from Virginia to Alabama, three things are true. Women are in the majority, women of color are in the lead, and black women are in the vanguard. And I'm including my transgender sisters in this. Women of color are shining a light on the path to freedom for all of us. They're shining a light on the path out of gun violence, saying, you know what? A ban on assault rifles is good, but not enough. When nearly every mass shooting in this country has been carried out by white men with a history of battering women and white nationalism, we have got to dismantle white supremacy and toxic masculinity in this country. And when our precious children of color are being terrorized in a pressure cooker of police brutality and mass incarceration and deportation, we must demilitarize state violence out of our communities before we fix our mouths to ask our children why they are turning guns on each other. And on the issue of reproductive freedom, women of color are shining a light on freedom for all of us, saying that the legal right to abortion is critical, but not enough when thousands of people can't access that right because they are poor or immigrant or transgender. We must repeal the Hyde Amendment. And even that, even that is not enough when in the richest country on earth, Black women face maternal mortality rates almost four times out of white women. We have got to fight for our right to parent and to live. On every defining issue of our time, women of color are shining the light on freedom for all of us, and we can help them make that light brighter. How many of you all have donated money to the fight to freedom in this country? Well, I want you to think about something before you write another check. Less than 3% of annual donations go to women of color leadership. That is something that we have the power to change. 
So 15 of the most prominent women of color movement leaders of our era have teamed with Groundswell to make it easy for you to change that, to make it easy to fund the best and brightest women of color-led organizing from coast to coast in this country. So here's how you can do it. Go to groundswellfund.org, or if you're interested in candidate and election work, C4 work, go to groundswellactionfund.org. Donate to a group that inspires you. You can donate to them directly, or you can donate to Groundswell, and we will make sure that it gets to the organizations that need it most. Let's build the kind of America we deserve. Let's get free. Yeah. My heart. Buenas tardes, Los Angeles. Buenas tardes. My name is Celinda Vasquez, and I am very proud to represent Planned Parenthood here on the... That's right. And I am a proud daughter of Puerto Ricans. And that's right. And the one call to action that we have right now is to invest in our youth. We do that every day in Los Angeles by way of one of our programs called the Peer Advocates Program. These are the leaders in our communities that are making change every single day around reproductive health care and justice and all of the issues that we care so deeply about right now. And let me tell you that we will fight this administration and we will continue to provide care no matter what. We see 234,000 patient visits in Los Angeles a year, and we will continue to do that no matter what, and we will continue to invest in our youth, in our communities, and without further ado, a first-generation Chicana from South LA is here. Hey, that's me. Hi. And that's what our call to action is. Jen, take it away. Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? Yes, I love this. So my name is Jennifer Torres. I'm a former teen peer advocate for Planned Parenthood Los Angeles. Woo! Woo -woo! Woo -woo! Growing up in Watts, um, being first generation Latina, hey, that's me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was, there was no spaces to talk about sex, sex health, reproductive health. Reproductive justice was not, no one talked about that. Um, so my sophomore year, I became involved with the peer advocate program at my high school, King Drew Medical Magnet. Anybody? Hey! <laughs> so I became a peer advocate, and ever since then, I've continued to advocate for my community, advocate for myself. Um, obviously, I love Planned Parenthood because they build the bridge between community and healthcare access. For the fight for reproductive justice. As a peer advocate, I've been taught and I've been trained as to be an educator on giving comprehensive sex health, non-judgmental information, reliable information, which is very important. And in essence, our duty is to empower those who don't feel that they have a voice in society. The skills that I've gained from Planned Parenthood, I continue to use them. Um, this time next Saturday, I will be graduating and be the first, one of the first people in my family to receive a college degree. <laughs> it's been a long time coming. I'm ready, okay? <laughs> um, my bachelor degree is in community health and with that, and with that I promise and I want to continue helping my community making sure that even though we are living in dark times, fighting for our marginalized communities that oftentimes are consistently in danger. I love Planned Parenthood for it provides the light, the love, and the protection for these, for these folks. So, and also Planned Parenthood stands with other movements. They fight for a Clean Dream Act, Black Lives Matter, com combating police brutality, fighting for trans rights. It doesn't end with healthcare. It's intersectional. I'm proud of being a, being a peer advocate and being a part of Planned Parenthood for they have shaped me for who I am and that I am forever grateful. Um, we must always support our youth, listen to our youth, empower our women for we, we're gonna be the change, okay? Thank you.
know we're over time, so I'm going to talk really fast. <laughs> My name is Saru, and I am the co-founder and president of the Restaurant Opportunity Centers United. We represent restaurant workers all across America. And we are about to hit the 13 million worker mark in our industry. We are the nation's largest and fastest growing private sector employer, one of the largest employers of women, and yet we continue to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Every year the Department of Labor puts out a list of the 10 lowest paying jobs and we always win the award. Seven of the 10 lowest paying jobs in America are always in one industry, food service, the restaurant industry. And that is because of the money, power, and influence of a trade lobby called the National Restaurant Association. We call it the other NRA. It's been around for 150 years, actually, since emancipation, because it turns out that tipping as a practice didn't originate in the US. It originated in feudal Europe. When think Downton Abbey, or if you read like old English literature, you'll see references to tipping. Tipping was something that aristocrats and nobles gave to serfs and vassals always on top of a wage. Well, when the idea came to the States, it was right around the time of emancipation, and the restaurant lobby demanded the right to hire newly freed slaves and not pay them anything at all and let them live completely on tips. And that idea of a zero dollar wage was made law in 1938 for a mostly black female workforce who were given zero dollars when everybody else was given a minimum wage and told that tips would bring them to the full minimum wage. And we went from zero dollars in 1938 to a whopping two dollars and 13 cents an hour, which is the current federal minimum wage for tipped workers in these United States in 2018. And it is between two and seven dollars in 43 states in the United States, including New York and our nation's capital, Washington DC, where the wage is three dollars and 33 cents, and Massachusetts, where the wage is three dollars, and Pennsylvania, where the wage is two dollars and 83 cents an hour. This is not a tiny sliver of America. This is the largest employer of women. And today, 70 percent of tipped workers who live on these absurd wages are women. They are women who work in IHOP and Applebee's and Olive Garden. They suffer from three times the poverty rate of the rest of the U.S. workforce, use food stamps at double the rate, and suffer from the highest rates of sexual harassment statistically of any industry in the United States. Because when you are a woman working at IHOP or Denny's or Applebee's, your wage is so low it goes to taxes, you get a pay stub that says this is not a paycheck, it says zero, and you live completely off your tips, which means you must tolerate whatever the customer does to you, however they touch you or treat you or talk to you or grab you because the customer is always right, because the customer is feeding your family tonight, not your boss. And the manager tells you, dress more sexy, show more cleavage, wear tighter clothing in order to make more money in tips, which means we are told not to tolerate harassment, but to go out and get it. Go encourage it, and the more you can get, the better off you are. And because this is the first job for most of us, most of us, this is our first job in high school, college, and graduate school. This is how we are exposed to the world of work. This is where we learn what is acceptable and tolerable and legal and ethical in the workplace. So much so that older women say to us, you know, I've been sexually harassed more recently, but I didn't do anything about it because it was never as bad as it was when I was a young woman working in restaurants. Which means our industry's harassment doesn't just affect us, it affects the whole industry, the whole economy. And what we need is what seven states have already done, which is one fair wage. California requires the restaurant industry to pay the full minimum wage with tips on top. California has the fast, largest and fastest growing industry in America. It has higher restaurant sales per capita, higher job growth, and one half the rate of sexual harassment. And one third the rate of managers telling women, dress more sexy, show more cleavage. Because women in California get a full wage, they don't have to put up with everything. So why can't every state do that? Well, thanks to Thanks to Tarana, who's coming up next. Tarana got me to come with her to the Golden Globes, along with many other activists in the room, Ijin and Monica and many others. And thanks to that moment, Governor Cuomo announced that he would make New York the eighth state in the union to eliminate the lower wage for tipped workers. But it's got to happen. It hasn't happened yet. We're on the ballot this year in D.C. and Michigan. There are many more states to come, but the NRA is fighting us hard. They are showing up at hearings and surrounding the women who are standing up, 20 of whom are here today. I want to give a shout out to the restaurant workers in the room. 
They surround our women at hearings and they shout us down and they say, we don't need our wages to go up. They're men. Sexual harassment doesn't happen in our industry. The Restaurant Association has mobilized men in our industry to fight the women. They are trying to divide the workers. The majority is us, the women. So here is our call to action. Go to onefairwage.org. Tell your legislator we need one fair wage, as it was in feudal fricking Europe. One wage with tips on top. Tell your favorite restaurant owner to support one fair wage at that same site. Tell every restaurant worker every time you eat out, we need one fair wage. You deserve a paycheck and a wage with tips on top, not just tips. Because ultimately, here's my question to all of us. Who gets to determine how we are paid as women? Who gets to say whether our daughters will grow up and their first job be told, go dress more sexy and show your breasts? Who gets to say who controls this country? Is it trade lobbies like the NRA or is it we, the women? Thank you. Please welcome to the stage, Tarana Burke. Look at us. Look at us. Whew. I'm tired, y'all, but y'all give me a lot of energy. <laughs> You know, um, one of my favorite authors, Zora Neale Hurston, in her book, Their Eyes Were Watching God, has a quote that says, there are some years that ask questions and there are some years that answer them. And I think the last couple of years I've asked a, a few questions. <laughs> like, how did we get here? <laughs> how will we get away from here? And, what will history say about us in this moment? I believe that we are entering a period of answers. 2017 asked, when will it be time for a reckoning around sexual violence? And 2018 said, now. 2017 asked, who will speak for the children? And in 2018, the children said, we will. The fact is, we have the answers right here, right now. We are the answers. Women from all walks of life, across the gender spectrum, race, class spectrum, we have the answers. Black women, brown women, Asian women, trans women, queer women, disabled women, women survivors, we have the answers. People often reference the quote that was made famous by Dr. King, which is, uh, the moral arc of the universe is long and bends towards justice, right? We've all heard that quote. But that arc doesn't bend on its own. We, the work that we do is the weight that is provided on that arc that bends it closer and closer to justice every day. So here's the charge. We're in a unique historical moment, y'all. Everybody in this room knows that we have not been able to sustain a national dialogue around sexual violence, around women's rights, around equity, in the ways that we have recently, ever. Right? Y'all agree with that? Oh, okay. <laughs> but I submit that we will lose that opportunity if we don't start talking about and thinking about and moving differently now. Meaningful, ch uh oh. We will lose an opportunity to make deep, meaningful change if we don't recognize that we are the answers. They asked us to give a call to action earlier. And the action was, to, we, we were required to ask you to join something, volunteer for something, learn something, or campaign for something. I'm asking you to do all of them. We're trying to build something that has never existed. It is going to take every single one of us doing all the things we can at capacity in order to make that happen. We're trying to build in the Me Too movement, the actual Me Too movement, a survivor-led movement that centers those often pushed to the margins 
and gives unprecedented access to, access to resources for healing while galvanizing both survivors of all forms of sexual violence and our allies to interrupt sexual violence. That's a mouthful. But in essence, it just says what the poet June Jordan put so eloquently, that we are the ones we've been waiting for. So learn more about our work in the Me Too movement and the work of the others who stood here before me and figure out where your passions lie. Volunteer with one of our organizations or with an organization doing similar work in your communi community locally. Join a local Me Too group or another advocacy group doing the work that moves you. But know that you are the answers. If you want to know where to start, how to get active, start there. And I'm gonna turn off my phone for a second because I wanna say something else. This is, I was listening to the people coming one after another. I've been listening to folks all day. We've had a wonderful time. But this is the thing I know about when women gather and when, and when, we, when we get together. We start figuring out where the problems are and we start coming up with solutions and we get geared up to work. And I hope that everybody leaves here today energized and inspired and ready to go back in their community and tear shit down, yeah. right? But let me also say this, because there are a lot of you who are survivors of sexual violence in the room. There are a lot of you who are survivors of general violence in the room. There are a lot of you who are just surviving in the room. And so my other charge to you is this, be gentle with yourself. Be gentle with yourself. There's a lot of work that we have to do. There's always gonna be a lot of work for us to do. But you have to take care of yourself. And so I charge you to not let your life be consumed by the work, because taking care of yourself is a part of the work. I need you to understand that when you leave here. And as long as it's been going on, we know the work is gonna be here. And so I challenge you to find joy in your life. And I challenge you to curate joy in your life and guard it with your life. I challenge you to protect what makes you happy and brings you joy, even if it's the work. I challenge you to lean into that joy and let that joy lead you. This work is gonna be here. But you being alive, you living and thriving, that's how you speak truth to power because they tried to kill us, y'all. They try to take us out. They try to tell us that we can't. And so if you don't campaign anywhere, if you don't join nothing, if you don't volunteer nowhere, I want you to live and let your living, let your existence be resistance. Thank you. Introducing Ari Afsar. This is for every badass woman here in this room. I wrote this for you. Yeah, I'm playing, cause we know 
Money is power. Live the life I want power. Start my dream business power. Get your hand off my leg power. But women, we've had less of it because our society and institutions have put us at a disadvantage. We've been told not to talk about money. We've been paid less for the same jobs. We've been financially penalized for having children. Enough. We won't be fully equal with men until we're financially equal with men. So let's use the power that we have to change the money game for ourselves and for all women. Let's disrupt money. We will talk about money with our friends, with our partners, and with our daughters. We will negotiate money on every raise, every promotion, and every new job. We won't tolerate gender pay gaps at work, and we'll demand leadership teams that reflect what we look like today, not in 1957. We'll support businesses owned by women, and we won't spend our money on companies that don't promote women or that objectify us. We will invest in ourselves and and our futures will invest in other women. We'll show that what's good for the world can be good for our wallets. And we will advocate for policies that level the playing field, like paid family leave and the Paycheck Fairness Act. If millions of us and our allies speak up, invest in other women, and demand equality at our workplaces and from our government, we can do this. We can change the game. We can disrupt money. And now, Valerie Jarrett and Sally Krawchuk. I want to tell you a little bit about Sally. So Sally spent 25 years on Wall Street, which doesn't really make sense because she just celebrated her 25th birthday. But the thing about Sally that I want to tell you, which might surprise you, is that Sally, notwithstanding the fact that she was one of the senior women on Wall Street, always performed at the top performance level, was fired not once, but twice. But that is exactly, <laughs> wow. But that is to our good fortune, because what it led her to do was to think about the next chapter. So Sally, <laughs> money. Why is it important, and what are you doing? Yeah, well, well, thank you for that kind introduction. Well, Howard. I think it's important for people to understand you can have multiple chapters, hey. and the deck was stacked against you. Well, well, that's right. But you know, failure, the other side of failure is success. Exactly. So money, let's say you and I go out for a drink or two or three after this. Sounds like a plan. And you and I say, you know what? Let's form a patriarchal capitalist society where the women don't have as much power as we do. All right, what would we do? We'd make it so that we don't let women talk about money. Hey, mommy and daddy, how much do you make? We don't talk about that in our family. We give girls lower grades in math for bo than boys for the same answers. We would pay women less for doing the same jobs just for being women, and even less for being women of color. We'd pay them less again for having children. And we'd keep them out of the money industry. We'd make it so the traders on Wall Street were 90% men, financial advisors, 86% men. Raise your hand if you think the financial crisis would have been more severe if that were 50% women. Yeah, one person raised a couple people <laughs> over there. We would make money so weird and so shameful that we as women would talk about sex more than we talk about money. We'd that's be more true. likely, you know that's now, true. I don't know on what date you have sex anymore because I've been married for a while, but we'd make it so that you're more likely to have sex on the third date, that physically intimate act, than talk about money. If you talk about money, there's no fourth date. And as a result, we would have gender money gaps that would cost us women, the women in this, in this auditorium out there, hundreds of thousands of dollars, for some women millions of dollars, life-changing amounts of money over their lives. So tell, tell the audience what you're doing now and why you're investing in women. Tell us a little bit, and then also I want you to tell them what they, what they need to do. Well, here's what we need to do, guys. Who here thinks on a daily basis about how much money they're spending or investing in the institutions and companies that hold us back? Not many of us. 
right? Who's ready to do something different, right? All right. Who's ready to take the money we do control, the majority of consumer spending, trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars of investment, and take that money and change the game? Because guys, I love men. I've been married to a couple of them. If we wait... <laughs> If we wait for the guys, I'm afraid we're gonna keep waiting. And so what I would argue that we do is let's disrupt money. Let's use the power that we've got and let's go together and tonight at the drinks, let's talk to each other about money. Let's break that social taboo. When we go back to work, rather than being the one who asks for the raise, that hasn't worked. The gender pay gaps aren't closing. Feminism as an individual sport has stalled. We need to come together. We need to have our diversity group say, forget about the next cocktail party with the speaker. How about we get more women on the board, more women in senior leadership, and close our gender pay gaps? Come together from a position of strength. How about we spend money on those just kick-ass entrepreneurs we saw in the expo hall? so that we're spending money on women. How about we invest in women? So, for some folks, that seems weird. Invest in women? Well, what are we doing now? We're investing in men, right? We love men, but women tend to pay back their loans more quickly. The companies that women run have better returns than the companies run by men. When women have money, we give it to nonprofits to a greater degree. We put it into our families and we put it into our communities. It's a win, win, win. So why is it that we don't recognize the power we have? We've always had that power. We've always been in charge of yeah. the purse strings. Why have we not appreciated You know, the, the popular press has really told us recently, first of all, it infantilizes us when it comes to money. What's your money type? As opposed to invest in a diversified investment portfolio. And then what felt so good is I can do this by myself. I can go get that raise, I can take my seat at the table, I can strike my power pose. I love a power pose, but it's coming together that works. So what I'm going to ask us all to do, if you could pop up the slide, two things. First of all, LFS, which is a company I run, an investing platform for women. What I would ask you all to do is check out lfs.com um, slash disrupt money. For the next three weeks, we're gonna be providing resources, we're gonna be having a conversation, we're gonna write articles, we're gonna gather the conversation and advice from all of you and share it on how we can all approach money differently and disrupt money. The second thing we're gonna do is remember I talked about investing in other women? I gotta tell you, I believe in this so deeply, not just as the right thing to do, I think it's a smart thing to do, that at Elevest, if you go to either this site or elevest.com, slash USOW, we're gonna give you money. We're gonna give you $100 for the first thousand of you that go there to invest in women. We're gonna put it into an LFS impact portfolio that puts money in the hands of women. Say that one more time. Yeah. I'm not sure everybody heard you. I said free money. <laughs> <laughs> to invest behind other women, not give away as a nonprofit, right? but to actually invest in each other. And if we do that, put, put capital to companies that advance us and put hands in the money of women, guys, there's no friggin' stopping us. So let's disrupt money. All right, you heard it here. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome Connie Britton and Cindy Holland of Netflix. Thank you. How are you? Guys, I want to say something very quickly about the media and the importance of women in media. What? There is no media without women. This is about us being represented. It's about us being seen. Diversity and action. The media is yours. Use it. Make it your tool. Learn your voice, know your voice, and then insist on changing the world. Thank you.
So the first time I saw myself on television was in 1976. It was Charlie's Angels. The character was Sabrina Duncan. She was really smart, she wore pants, and she drove a Pinto. History forgives that about her. But <laughs> what we're doing at Netflix is we're trying to, find, to bring to life a lot of characters so that all of you can see yourselves on screen and have somebody that you want to be like, someone you can become. Characters like the ones that Connie has played. So what I'd like you all to do is go to hashtag first time I saw me on Twitter and tell your stories and see all the great stories there about characters that meant something to you. Thank you. Please welcome Tina Chen and Journey Smollett. <laughs> All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Tina, this is so amazing. Thank you for having <laughs> me here. Look at these beautiful people. OK, so time's up. Time's up, Tina. Time's up. Time's up. Time's up. Hashtag time's up. It's, it's a global movement. It's a little over 100 days old. It is all across the globe. It's leaderless. It's we stand here linked, not ranked. OK, so tell us, what's next? What's next? So what's next is, let's start with talking about the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. Yes. $21 million <laughs> in 100 days. Over 2,500 people have come to us for help. 2,500 in less than 100 days, over, just over 100 days. Two-thirds of them identify as low income. They are across 60 different industries, and they are saying things to us like, for the first time, I feel brave. For the first time, someone's listened to my story. So what's next is, we got to keep pushing on the Legal Defense Fund. Go to the National Women's Law Center's website, home of the Times Up Legal Defense Fund, nwlc.org. If you need help, you can find it there. If you are a lawyer, or a public relations expert, you can volunteer there. And if you're none of those things, you can support it by finding more money. Hold a fundraiser in your local books, book, your book group, your school, your neighborhood to support the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. And keep speaking out and supporting yeah. everyone in their workplace because Time's Up, we are going to create safe and dignified workplaces for everyone. That's our goal, yes. that's our mission. Work with us on it. Time's up! Time's up, this is your movement! All right! <laughs> Please give a warm welcome to Marley Diaz and Marseille Martin. Say Martin, actress on Blackish and a new executive. Oh, oh, this love thing. Okay. <laughs> I am blessed each day to play the daughter of a woman who, in real life and also on television, wants to make the world a better place. For me, as a young comedian and an actress, Tracy Ellis Ross is an inspiration. Long before I dreamed about being an executive producer, Tracy Ellis Ross was starring in Girlfriends and fundamentally changing the world and the rules of women could ever dream of. And I'm Marley Dias. Hi, everybody. I am an author and founder of hashtag 1000 Black Girl Books. And as you may know, thank you. And as you may know, my life over the last three years has been an adventure with obstacles like educational exclusion of black girl stories, social media bullying, and kids' disdain for reading. But like the heroes we are, I have overcome many of these obstacles in order to discover my purpose. But none of that would have been possible without the women who came before us. Working with mentors like Tracy is always an experience. When she's not stealing our food on set, <laughs> she is making us laugh with her funny characters. But her work and dedication to black girls is not a comedy. She is serious about making sure that we know that we are loved. She's serious about making sure black girls love ourselves and that we love ourselves just as we are. 
I truly, truly, truly admire her, and my hope is that one day I will too win a Golden Globe, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I will also serve as an inspiration for black girls. She will though, she will. She will win a Golden Globe. I'm trying, Globe. guys, I'm trying. But Booker T. Washington said, there are two ways of exerting one's strength. One is pushing down, the other is pulling up. The person coming to the stage today epitomizes this strength. During her time in the White House, but we're just going to say, but as you see, we'd like to introduce Miss Tracy Ellis Ross and Mrs. Michelle, Michelle Obama. Obama. Bye, everybody. Bye. Hi. Hey. <laughs> wow. I didn't realize. So this is what you all have been doing all day. Oh somebody's goodness. been having a good time out there. This woman needs right. no introduction. Let's give one more and then oh. we'll quiet down. Come on. Okay. Okay, everybody. Love you guys. Love you guys so much. Wow. This has been a day, huh? This has been a day. Okay. <clears throat> So I would like to start okay. by saying thank you oh. for all of the elements that conspired to bring you into our lives. Um, for the womanhood, the power, the grace, the beauty that all comes through the beingness of a black woman has been life-changing and culture-shifting. Did you hear me say that? Yeah. Life changing and culture shifting, and we are so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so guys, are you gonna be able to hear us if you keep screaming? <laughs> All right. All right, you guys. There you go. I know she's so that the everybody most lovable, behind. beloved woman ever. Oh my God, I'm, I am humbled and I'm, I'm honored and happy to be here. Tracy and I were being bad backstage chatting. We away. were chatting and we almost and missed we like, our intro. Uh, is that us? So, um, but thank, thank you, you, Tracy, for being here. I love, I, I, this is one of my favorite people in the whole wide world. Is there that picture of us? So, um, Mrs. O and I met in 2008, 2009. I went to the White House. Um, at the time for a mentor program. Mm -hmm. And we started a dialogue that I believe that we are still in. We're still in. Um, I know that all of you feel this, but even now, as two friends that text each other, mm -hmm. I still cannot call her Michelle. That, you know. <laughs> and I'll, I trick around it like, hey. I know, you, a lot of lady. people do that. It's like, hey, it's like, you don't know what to call me now, do you? I won't do it. I, you, it's Michelle. No, you, talk makes too me much, feel, you make me feel like I want to curtsy. It's odd. <laughs> it is odd. You can't call me "Hey, you" for the rest of our our lives. All right, we'll, we'll see. But okay, I doubt. all right, it's but take your time. I, I was you raised to... where you know respect is given, it and is... you deserve it. Well, so <laughs> all right, let's get into the conversation. Okay, let's okay. talk. So there's a lot of talk about using your voice, mm -hmm. standing up for something. And I'm curious if you remember the first time that you used your voice or that you couldn't, you couldn't be an innocent bystander, like you had to speak up, and what it was that gave you the courage to do that and what it felt like. 
You know, there are so many of those instances because I was that little kid. I was the bossy little kid, and I was fortunate enough to have parents who appreciated my opinions and my voice from an, a very early age. And I say that to parents out there, you know, how do you start teaching voice? You teach it young by listening and ask, asking your child questions and, and hearing their opinion. And, you know, you, you can't be rude, but I was allowed to express myself. And one of my first uh, times I remember my, my paternal grandfather, Dandy, and I write about this in, in my book. Dandy, I love my grandfather, Dandy, but he was kind of a, he could be kind of a bully sometimes. Um, and for reasons I discuss in the book, just the way his life worked out and his disappointments, there were times that sometimes he would be a bully to my grandmother, you know, just sort of complaining about dinner. And we would go to dinner at their house every Sunday He'd have the big, big console TV on, and he'd have his in cigar Chicago. in Chicago. They, and he would be complaining about something, you know? And I was probably four at the time, and no one contradicted Dandy, but, except for me. <laughs> and at a very early age, I would just go up to him and say, Dandy, why are you yelling? You know, what is your problem? You shouldn't yell at grandma like that. And my aunts and uncles who were younger than my father, but they were teenagers at the time, they would never talk back to him. And I would always, I felt like I had to stand up for my grandmother because she didn't, she was more traditional. You know, you didn't talk back to your husband and she was a church going woman. She was very soft spoken and she would just sort of take it. But I just couldn't stand by, even at four, and watch her be yelled at for no reason. So, but my parents supported that. And I was gonna say, so that you brings know? me to another question mm -hmm. that I have, um, which is one that my mother wanted me to ask. Yeah. Which is, <laughs> and by the way- We know her mom, right? Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> I actually have, uh, I remember saying when you were talking, I remember, because my mom also encouraged a voice. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I don't know how old I was, very, very, very young. And my mom did the, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. And I said, why, why not? not? And she said, I don't know. It's a <laughs> <laughs> but I, I had a tendency to, yeah. yeah. And I had to learn how to do it respectfully. That's right. But it learn has, to, but it starts very young. It does, and it grows into something. Even teachers, I mean, if I felt like some, some injustice happened to me at school, I spoke up. I remember I, I, uh, I, I couldn't get the, I didn't get all the words right in a spelling uh, exercise or a reading exercise when I was in kindergarten. I missed the word white. I couldn't sound it out. I could read. I Interesting. Could, I could read, but for whatever reason, I, that was the first time I remember choking in kindergarten. I just choked. I got all the letters I could read. I knew I could read but it was a little peer pressure. I got nervous, I, start, I, bl I blacked out, and I remember this clearly, and, and there were three other smart kids in the class, and I knew that I needed to get a star that day or else the teacher wouldn't think I was smart. Hmm. <laughs> so I went home, and I stayed up all night working on those words, and I went back, and that poor little kindergarten teacher, I said, I wanna redo my words. And she said, well, we're not doing that today. And I said, nope, nope, we gotta, I gotta, I gotta get my star today. And she pulled me aside and we tested the words and I got them all right and she gave me my star. She probably thought, please just go play with the blocks. But I don't I even know where you came I from. I hear two good lessons there. <laughs> when you get nervous, which is so interesting to think that mm -hmm. you get nervous, Oh, God, and, yeah. But when you do, that you can sometimes get another try. Absolutely. And we learn from our mistakes and in those moments. Um, because the, the, so there's two parts to what I was thinking as you were talking. Do you remember something specific that someone said to you growing up that helped to guide you to become the woman you are today? And you know, I, I wonder if that came from your mom hearing the, the relationship that you, you had. You know, it, it's, it's, it's never one thing. Mm. It's like there it's all one, though, the that, many, that... many lessons. I mean, you know, when you have, I, my, my mom is my, my rock, my role model, uh, my parents. They're, I, that was so the much of the mom. lessons that, 
they taught us spin around in my head every single day. Um, but the thing that makes you, it isn't the one thing, it's the many things, yeah. you know. It's get, whether you got that star in kindergarten, you know. It's what that third grade teacher said to you that made you feel good about yourself. It's the fact that I, it was the love that my father showed me. I mean, this is the thing for men in the room. I mean, having a, a man and a young woman's life who adores her and treats her like an equal to my brother, you know, my dad taught me to box right along with my brother. He got me my little set of boxing gloves and I was punching out my cousins and we were right there in it. Um, when he taught my brother how to throw, he taught me how to throw. Uh, it's little things like that, but the thing about it is, Tracy, that, which is what we have to remember, kids, little kids remember all those good p p points of input, but they remember the bad too. Yeah. You know, Kids know when they're being invested in, when people believe in them, when people care about them, but kids also know when they're not being invested in. They know when they're labeled a bad kid early, you know, when somebody doesn't give them a break, when they're not in a good school. Kids know when they're in the school that's not being invested in. And that's the thing we lose sight of. We think, well, they're just kids. It's like, no, no. no. Kids know, they, they know when somebody cares about them, and when somebody thinks highly of them and they know when people don't give a crap about them. So then the question would be, because there are a lot of people that that is the reality of their experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, they don't either have that parental guidance or love um, or they're in experiences where the actual environment is not treating them as mm -hmm. the treasure that they are. So how does one find that? Ooh. You got to find it wherever you can. I mean, and what I tell young kids is that, you know, all it takes is one mm -hmm. good person, mm -hmm. you know, and kids know those good people in their lives. So for the young people out there, I tell them, find those good folks because there's someone, maybe it's not your mom, maybe that person isn't in your household, maybe they're at church, maybe there's one of those teachers. You have to, when you find that person, you glom on to them. Yeah. You know, you stay in their face. You make, you make yourself their priority. And in order to do that, that means you gotta kinda have your stuff together. You know, because people are always looking for the good kids. They're looking for kids to mentor. And it, you know, your, your life isn't sunk because your mom didn't do what she was supposed to or your dad. There are plenty of kids who are beating the odds every single day. Yep. And it's because they believe the voices that they know. At some point, you're born with some innate sense of what is possible. That just sort of can, sometimes gets either beaten out of you or it gets reinforced. But I knew at a very young age that I was smart and that I made sense, I knew that. And I know there are a lot of kids out there that are waking up every day going, it's not me, it's, that's crazy, you know? And that's what you wanna tell kids to trust that part of themselves because you do get that instinct at a very young age. So when you know you're smart, you find the person who is, who sees, who that, sees in you. that in you. And that means you gotta be, you have to be wiser a lot older, uh, sooner. You know, you have to know how to shake off the bad people in your life. And that's a tough thing to ask young kids to do. But kids know this. You know when you're hanging around some of these friends, the folks that aren't going in the right direction, you gotta go the other way. No, but really, did you hear that? You know when you're with people. You know your crew. You know, and you if know, they are not you, pulling you, you know, into you, your own joy it, and your own light, you, keep it moving. You have to surround yourself with the people that you want to be. Yeah. You know, the other thing I tell young people is life is practice. You know, uh, you, you're practicing, and I tell my girls this every day, you are practicing who you are going to be. So if you're getting up late and you're trifling and you're not getting your homework done, that's what you're practicing. If you know? you're complaining, that's what you're practicing. If you're a whiner, you're practicing being a whiner. If you're spoiled, you're practicing that. That doesn't, that doesn't just go away, you know? And so you have to start practicing who you want to be. Do you want to be dependable? Then you have to be dependable. Mm -hmm. If you want people to trust you, then you have to be trustworthy. trustworthy. Yeah. And, you, you, and you have to start those habits very early. It's just like speaking correct English. 
don't practice the other stuff because you're not going to get a job that way. So <laughs> practice who you want to be every single day. Um, and that's what I, I think kids need to do who don't have mentors in their lives. Find that role model somewhere out there, even if you read it in a book, you know, find that inspiration. Um, I never got to the question my mom wanted me to Oh, ask. what, yes, what was that? But you were talking about we mentors. digress. No, yes, it's okay. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about your relationship with your mom and how that influenced, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and how that me cry, right? influenced your relationship with your girls. Oh, my goodness. Um, I, the mother that I am today is a direct result of Marianne Robinson. Um, you know, my, my mom was, is one of the smartest people with, with just plain old common sense. And the, the thing she always said that I do remember is that she told, told me and my brother, she says, I, I wasn't raising children, I was raising adults. So she treated wow. us, she practiced treating us in the way she wanted us to be. So mm -hmm. again, she always talked to us like we had since. Mm -hmm. She never used baby talk. She would ask you to explain yourself and she would include you in big grown up conversations. There was never anything that she wouldn't talk to us about. If I had questions about, you know, that uncle in the back, you know, and be like, well, let me tell you his story and why he's back there and how you, how, how you stay out of the back Everybody closet. Everybody has an uncle. Everybody's got an uncle. You don't knock on his door. When he comes out, he's a little drunk. We had, we had our share, you know, and be like, well, what's wrong with him? Well, let me tell you his story. So there was never anything off limits. She, she gave us chores early on. She, my, my father, they taught us the, the value of money. I remember my father one day, my brother thought we were rich. I don't know why, because we, you know, that's, you were that's rich how with love. we were rich with love in our little bitty apartment. Um, but one day he put out his whole paycheck, he had it cashed, in cash. And he sat there with my brother and he laid out every bill and he put money on top of every bill he had to pay in the month and then what he was left with, which wasn't much, he said, this is what goes to everything that you ask for. Wow. <laughs> and we were young at that time and you know, if you're sitting there with your dad with maybe $20, $40 for the rest of the month, you start thinking about whether you really want those new pair of shoes and whether you really need to do that extra thing. You know, um, that's how our parents were. That's who my mom was to, to us. Um, so she had a lot of common sense, and so I, I emulate her in the relationship that I have with my girls. I mean, I, I want them to talk to me about everything. So that means I gotta be open and I can't be judgmental and you, you know, you have to get that mom face right. It's like, oh, is, did that happen? Okay, <laughs> tell me more. <laughs> you know, you just... <laughs> trying not to react so you get the good information. You're just sitting there, it's just like, <laughs> you did what? Okay, no, okay, no, okay. It, fix, fix, the, fix the face. It's like, okay, continue. <laughs> I try to tell Sasha and Malia, do not go to other 14-year-olds for information because all you all are dumb. <laughs> Come talk to me. It's like, don't, you know, you all know nothing. <laughs> You know, don't be sitting that, around in your age. little crew that's, figuring out life. It's that's like the age I'm, where it starts that you think you know, you think everything. You know everything. And it's like, y'all, all of you are dumb. <laughs> you know nothing. You Love you. It in your experience. So let's just talk about it. Don't don't ask Olivia what she thinks about sex. She's like, she doesn't know. Your girls have had <laughs> Your girls have had the same friends, though, for a long time, because oh, I've have. been around the same oh, yes. group. Oh, yes. Yeah. And so they've got a good core group. They got a good core group, and but they thought still... they knew everything right. at 14, and they okay. did not. So, so I try to be open with my girls and, you know, also help them practice their voice. Yeah. Because if they're not practicing with us, with me, with Barack at our dinner table, if they aren't learning how to make arguments and how to, you know, they express the themselves. Name. Barack Obama. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's a good one. 
want to pause this. Barack Obama. I have so many questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I am not going to tell him you all reacted this way. He doesn't need to know this. And be like, no, they didn't even ask about you. <laughs> and when I said your name, no one did anything. So I yeah, just no, moved on. We didn't, we didn't talk about you. So <laughs> speaking of 14-year-olds and, and not knowing much, do you think that young girls are dreaming differently today than we dreamed when we were young? And there's a couple parts to this mm -hmm. question. And what did you dream of when you were young? Because it worked out really well, and we'd love to know. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, do you think there's a way that we can help everyone dream in a more limitless way that is not gender-based mm. and that is custom, like that it's really curated mm. for your own experience, not the way life has a tendency to limit us, even when we don't know it. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I know that for me, you and I have talked a lot about mm -hmm. this, there was, culture was egging me to dream of my wedding. Yeah, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, I was also dreaming of Oscars and bossing people around and things yeah, like that, yeah, but there was yeah. a lot but of no, preoccupation that is there. with yeah. that that I'm still unpacking. Yeah. And I'm curious, sort of how we can talk about dreaming yeah. and, uh, you know, it's, it's such a great question. Um, I don't know that, that, that young girls are there yet. I think, think we're still at that stage where we're trying to figure out what it means to be women um, and what we think of ourselves, what we think of each other. And, you know, sorry, in, in light of this last election, I'm concerned about us as women and how we think about ourselves and about each other and, what, and what's really going on. I mean, I, I think more about what, what, what is going on in our heads where we let that happen, you know? Um, so I do wonder, what are, what are young girls dreaming about if we're still there? Where, yeah. When the most qualified person running was a woman, and look what we did instead. I mean, that says something about where we are. You know, I forget everybody else. What, that, that's what we have to explore, because if, if we as women are still suspicious of one another, if we're still, if, 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 we, if we still have this crazy, crazy bar for each other that we don't have for men, yeah. if, if we're still doing that today, if we're more comfortable with if we're not comfortable with the notion that a woman could be our president compared to what, you know, then, no, no, but we, but we have to but sort of, real. And I think we have to have that conversation with ourselves as women. This isn't a, this isn't an external conversation because that's on us. It's also a conversation of what are we asking women and, and men or boys and girls to dream of different things. We talk so much about empowering young girls. What is the I still think I still think that our girls are taught to be perfect. And I think that we, they still dream of weddings and, and the security of the Prince Charming coming to say, I still think we do, I think we're working on it. I think, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm proud of what I hear from young girls, but I think something happens when they get to that stage where you're supposed to be married and have kids. Missed you it. Know? A and <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. I mean, we've talked a lot about but that. But there's still the notion when you say, oh, oh you don't have kids. Oh my God. I it's know. almost uh, Tracy Ellis Ross must not be happy because she's not married with kids. Look where I'm sitting. Look it. <laughs> And look at what she is doing with her life. But still, societally, we kind of look at that and go, oh, oh, you poor thing. I know. And then you're happy as, as a clam until somebody. And then you start to. You think, start thinking, well, maybe I'm not happy. Did, did something happen? What like, did I do? What, is what it happened my fault? to me all of a sudden? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think we have to have these conversations because this is still going on. I wish that girls could fail as 
bad as men do and be okay. Because let me tell you, watching men fail up, it, it, is, it is frustrating. Very frustrating. It is frustrating to see a lot of men blow it and win. And we hold ourselves to these crazy, crazy standards. We hold each other to these standards. And so what do I, well, I, when I was young, I, didn't, I was like a regular kid. I dr dreamt of play those games of who are you going to marry, which mm -hmm. of the boys, and the number game. You remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With yeah, the, yeah. The, that little origami thing. That the was origami like, thing yeah. where you have the number, and in there would be the boy, how, how many kids you'd have, and where you get married. And it was, for me, it was Hawaii, believe it or not. Are you serious? Yeah. But not because I knew anything about Hawaii. It was warm. You always pick the warm city. You didn't want to be, you didn't want to live in your own city. But who, who, who knew? Um, but I dreamt of being a mother. I dreamt, but I, you know, I also had aspirations. Obviously, I, want, I thought I wanted to be a pediatrician at one point, And then I took math and science. And I was like, mm, no. Um, <laughs> I think I'll, I'll use my voice, I'll be a lawyer. And then that, 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 that didn't work out. So, um, so no, I didn't, I didn't know what I could be. I, I didn't completely know. I, I'm still of that generation where our dreams were still pretty limited. Yeah. So what, what do I want for, I, I think if we want our daughters to dream bigger than we did, then, then we have more work to do. Yeah. Um, we, we haven't really, you know, I think we've gotten, so many of us have gotten ourselves at the table, but we're still too grateful to be at the table to really shake it up. You know, I think we're, and, and that's not a criticism because for so many, just getting to the table was so hard, right? And so you just holding on, just trying to, but now we have to take some risks for our girls. We have to be willing to, lose a little bit of something, that we can't, just holding on to our seats at the table won't be enough to help our girls be all that they can be. Um, and I, I think it's going to be on, on us as women, but I think men have an important role to play yeah. in that as well. I mean, what I've been telling a lot of men as I go around speaking, it's just, you know, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't whisper these magical thoughts in your daughter's ear about who she can be and what she can do and then leave and go into a workplace that you either run or manage and you tolerate uh, an existence, you know, uh, you, you, you can't have it both ways because the workplace that you work in, the times you turn your head, you look the other way, the times you're sitting at a table where there are no people of color, no women, if you're tolerating that, that is the workplace that's gonna be waiting for your for little your girl. Daughter. And, but you've told her, you've sold her a bill of goods. Yeah. You told her she could be anything, but then you're not working to yeah. make sure that that is act can be actualized. And so men have to kind of understand Things just don't work out for your little precious pea if you're not making it work for all of us. And I think this is a time for all of us, including and especially men, to stretch outside of our comfort zone and notice the places mm -hmm. and be awake enough yeah. to use our voice, stand up for each other, and actually be of service to the change that's occurring and that we all want. And it's not easy, but it's something that has to happen. Well, we, yeah, we have to be a, a lot uh, of, uh, we have to feel a lot of discomfort. Yeah. We have to be okay with that. And, you know, so if you're sitting in, in any room and there's only y'all in the room. Notice. Notice and, and have a problem with that. Yeah. Don't be okay with that, you know? Um, so speaking of the times that we're in, um, because it is uncomfortable, it is justifiably um, appalling and terrifying, um, but but not that, for everybody. Not well. So, but that's important to remember. It's that not is, thank for you. everybody. Okay. So we can't just sit in our rooms and go, aren't we outraged? Some people are like, Some people this are is not. good. Ugh. They're quite satisfied. That is true. Um, but with that fear that comes for those that are 
appalled and so uncomfortable um, and frightened. The tendency and the ease is to shame, blame, scream, um, but the fertility in the moment is to take action. Um, so how do we each stay motivated to use our own voices um, and to show up? And, and how do we do that as individuals? Like you say that, you see it. But not all of us have the resource and the support to be able to speak up because that means you might lose your job. You mean, you know, all of those things. So how do each of us find that moment to be an advocate? I mean, not that you have all the answers, but yeah. maybe you do. <laughs> just maybe. Just maybe. You know, I always, I always think you, you, you start with what you can control. You know, you start there because, yeah, thinking about changing your workplace and, you know, changing the way the world thinks, that's big and it, mm. it gets daunting and then you shrink from that, right. right? So start with what you can control and that's you first. Yeah. And those questions start within, you know. First of all, we have to start asking ourselves, are we using our voices? Right. Are we, when, and when, when are we not? When are we playing it safe? Mm -hmm. And at least be cognizant of that, that fact and understand, well, these are the times that I, I, I shrunk away from doing more than I could. And let me think about why that was. Stop that. <laughs> but, we think, but we think about, well, that's a whole nother story because, you know, that's not the answer either. And when I hear people say, you run, it's, it's part of the problem, you know? It's it, w what, we still didn't get yes, we can right. It's not yes, you can, it's yes, we can. And until we get that right, it doesn't matter who runs. Because we, look, I, I don't think I'm any different from Hillary. And until women get this stuff right, there's a lot of people who are like, you do it. And then it's like, oh, my bad. I, I, I'm sorry. And there's midterms coming up, I didn't for example. I feel like it, you know? Um, so we got, we got a lot of work to do before we're focused on the who. Because we're the, we're the who. That we're, we are the answer. All of us here in the room are the answer to our own problems. It is not finding the one right person that we think can save us from ourselves. It's us. It's us. So we've got to do that work internally first to figure out, well, what can I do in my life? What am I doing to empower the girls in my life to have a voice? Because the biggest impact a woman can have is on her children, quite frankly. So are we, that's a powerful, you know, when I said I'm mom in chief and a lot of women ridiculed me for that, when I first came in, the, the first best, most important job I have control over is who my girls are gonna be. And until I got, and if I can't get them right, I can't get y'all kids right. I can't work for anybody else because I, I have a level of control over who Malia and Sasha were until at least now. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's over. Um, that's over. So the window's short, y'all. You know, you do what you can, and then they're 14, and yep. they think they know everything, and you're like, okay, go out there, get your butt kicked, and then you'll figure it out. But, but I feel like that's, we can start with ourselves, yeah. we can start with our kids, we can start with in our own families. There are still women who are, aren't speaking up at their own dinner tables. Yeah. You know, they're not gonna contradict their husbands or their fathers or, and we have to figure out, are we doing that? Are we part of that? You know, because- and how can we support those women to find the courage and the ability to speak up in those private ways? That it is terrifying. And, but it is a habit that has to be practiced yep. because we can't give other people their voices. Nope. People have to decide, you have to dig way down deep. Some people, like I said, temperamentally, like me, I am always chatting and telling people what to do. And, you know, temperamentally, we were like that. But there, all of us are gonna have to dig deep down inside of ourselves and figure out what fights we are willing to fight for ourselves and for our kids and then take that action. And a lot of times that action is small. 
Yeah. It's speaking up for your kids at school. It's going into your workplace and doing whatever you can short of getting fired, you know, because no, that won't help, but to try to make a change in that workplace. What's happening at your dinner table? What kind of conversations? How are your other girlfriends thinking? You know, those are the, those are, battles are just as important than the big fights. Because let me tell you, you all have more influence in the lives of the people who love you than I do, no matter what you say. You know, you all are sitting at dinner tables with folks who don't agree with you, who aren't trying to empower you. What are you doing at those dinner tables? Because if you can't have that discussion with your husband or with your father, then it's going to be hard to change anybody else because you haven't sort of started in your circle. And, that, and, if, and if you practice that courage first, that's powerful yeah. as far as I'm concerned. That leads to bigger things. Change starts close to home. Agreed. You know, that's where it starts. So looking for the next person to run, and I don't mean to be, you know, to cut that off, but that's, that's been our distraction. Mm -hmm. We're just going to wait for the next person to save us. We thought it was Barack Obama, and he didn't end racism. So I don't know. Oh my God. What do we do now? <laughs> so. But that's, you know, I mean, it's like, I voted for the black man and we're still living in racism. And it's like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I think that uncovered a lot. A lot of the curtain got pulled back. Yeah. Um, so we're almost out of time. I will no, end. No, we're not. Oh man, that was short. It was short. That was a jip. Blame Tina Chin on that. <laughs> It's always Tina's fault. That's it's always said. Um, <laughs> where do you find hope? Oh. And when yeah. you can't find it, what do you do? Oh, you can always find hope. I find hope in all these beautiful young people. Man. Oh my goodness. That's why when I was first lady, whenever I got down, I read some bad clips, something happened, I was like, please just put me with some kids. I just need to be with some kids because that's what this is all for, you know? It's, I mean, you, you know, we all have young people in our lives and they, they all come on to this planet, on this earth, with all this possibility. They're all, 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 all our children are good and they are beautiful and they are, they, they just yeah. look to us for so much. They are so open. And, you know, they, they don't come here jaded. They don't come here as misogynists. They don't come here hating people because of their, their sexual orientation. They come here pure and clean and open. And then we feed all that stuff into them. But it's all there. And, and, and you look at the kids from Parkland and you look at all, you know, the kids who were her, who are stepping out, they're going to be the ones that make the change because they're fearless. They're not worried about what they're going to lose and how they look and how do I leverage. They, they're not there yet, so they're still so open. Um, and every thing I do, I think about how it's going to impact these young people. And, and, and you think because of them, we can't give up. I mean, what, what choice do we have? What what future am I passing on to my girls and all our kids if I, I wake up and, I, I, and I'm hopeless? That there is no use in that. All we have is hope. That's all, that's all we have. We hope for, when we have hope and we have work. We, can, we hope Action. and we work. We hope, we work, we pray. We do all of that at the same time, but you, you can never afford to give up hope. And our kids deserve better than that. They deserve better than us shrugging our shoulders and saying, that's too hard. I can never do this. I can never do that. Mm -mm. So our young people always give me hope. And we always have reason to, to work hard for them. Agreed. Agreed. It's so hard to let it end. Well, let me just say this. This, this room, this summit, this is also a reason for hope, um, because I think some of what we, what, what we miss is, is that we don't often, in this internet world, in this social media world, we, we don't come together. And you feel alone, right? And you watch the news and you think that 
that doesn't reflect me or what is, what is this world coming to? And then you come into a room like this where there are so many people from so many walks of life who want the same thing. And this is, this is America and it's everywhere. It isn't, you know, it isn't just locked up in little cities and it's everywhere. We just get confused because we don't get to talk to each other. We don't get to connect and we don't get to be, remind ourselves of how much we have in common as a people. That we want just basic stuff like yeah. my, my mom and dad. We want decent jobs. We want our kids to get a good education. We want to have some health insurance. We want our kids to go to college and have a good life. We want to be able to retire and live in dignity. Yeah. You know, not everybody wants some big home or man cave and a big car and a jet. <laughs> You know, most, most people don't, you know. They respect each other, they live with decency and truth. That's who we are, and times like this should remind us all, you know, of what we're all working for. And I'm, I'm proud of everyone who's worked to organize this to keep these efforts up. And this is the do that we talk about. So it's, it's coming together like this and finding those that are doing and lifting up the work, even if it's not your work, it's finding the work of others and helping in very small ways to lift things up. You don't have to be first lady, you don't have to be president, you don't have to run for anything to have a significant impact and to make the changes that we're looking for. And this is how you begin. So I'm just thankful to everyone who has put so much work into this summit. And I know that there's more work that we have to do in the months and years to come. It never ends. It never ends. And Tracy, you're out there, girl, just holding it together and doing a phenomenal job. I'm so proud of you. I really am, and I love you. Thank you, Michelle. There we go. to really take that on. Thank you to the city of Los Angeles, who's been an incredible host to us here. We hope you continue to really live that spirit of the United States of Women, and we know you all will. Thank you to our incredible LA host committee. But we're not done yet, are we, Taylor? We're not done yet at all, guys. You know what's coming on day two. We have over 40 incredible groups hosting events all across the city where you're gonna learn more about convening, connecting, and amplifying, and moving this forward. All right, thank you. We're now, what are we gonna do now? Take action, one million actions. Remember, today was our moment. Tomorrow, we redouble our efforts for the movement. If not now, when? If not us, who? Thank you. Let's go, girls.